Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome today and uh, welcome to everybody who's joining us by uh, Zoom. And uh, for those who are joining us by Zoom, if you have questions or whatever, you can type them in and uh, they'll be presented to uh, Richard. If you have questions during this session, yep. before we get to the end, just raise your hand and I will pass the mic around. He's more than happy to answer those questions as he's going through his uh, presentation. I think we have a really interesting uh, program today on uh, higher education. I'm sure you're all aware of what uh, is going on. Uh, there are many questions uh, revolving around uh, student loan payments and uh, whether or not uh, that moratorium is gonna stay in place and how much uh, students may actually get in the long run. I thought you might be interested to know that uh, just for the heck of it, I went back and looked at what my tuition was <laughs> back in the late 60s and early 70s and compared on an equivalent, equivalent basis to what it is today. It works out to about a third of what it costs to go to college today. So you can, you can understand why it's such a big issue right now with uh, parents and uh, students. And um, there's no indication that that's going to change uh, anytime uh, soon. Uh, we got a great speaker today. Uh, Richard was at Oak College as dean for 33 years. That's almost unheard of in higher education for a dean to last that long. It's amazing that he's uh, been able to withstand all the pressures over that period of time, but he's done a wonderful uh, job. Um, <clears throat> I might add that um, <laughs> we have an interesting relationship because he's also my brother-in-law. So I have to be very kind to him today and uh, not humiliate him or embarrass him in any way. And he made that very clear that he would get even with me if I did anything like that. Richard has a uh, bachelor's degree from uh, Luther College in Iowa. He also has a master's and a PhD from uh, Michigan State University. So he's been well served uh, in terms of his uh, education in that. So I'm not gonna uh, take any more time at this point. I'm gonna turn it over to him if you do have a question again, while he's presenting, just raise your hand and I'll bring the mic over to you and you can ask it uh, uh, when you're ready. So, Richard. Thank you and um, it's good to have you here, please. Um, I'm much more used to talking to 18 to 22 year olds. So this is a different audience for me. And, and so for me, um, I'm gonna have to try to figure that out a little bit as I go. Um, Dr. Dersham's here, and, and certainly Dr. Dersham um, was part of Hope, and Mrs. Boltman's here, and so they are eloquent in their own rights, and, and they have stories to tell as well. I think my journey at, um, in higher education is kind of my life. Um, prior to being at Hope College, I was, the, um, I was at University of California, and so my career spans being at Michigan State, University of California, and, and the biggest chunk is um, at Hope College. And the, the work that I did for that, that period of time of um, 40 some years has always been with students. Um, my doctorate really looks at uh, higher education as an organization. And so my comments today are really gonna look at higher education as, as an institution and as an organization. It's not gonna, I'm not gonna speak to students. They'll be part of it. We'll talk about the, demo, the demography of students and how that's all shifting and things like that. So they'll be a part of that, but I'm not gonna talk about kind of my experiences with students. That in, in and of itself is a lot of fun and, and um, I really, I value students. I think when we think of our college experiences, when I think back on my college experience is that um, we didn't have phones and uh, like we do today, right? Um, we all had typewriters. We don't have those today, right? Um, we all wrote letters home to mom and dad um, asking for money. And, and, and hopefully mom and dads would send money back, right? Um, in my case, my family said, uh, my dad in particular, and mom as well said, you're gonna go 600 miles um, out to Iowa. My dad was a faculty member at Michigan State. And he says, you're not going to the school that I teach at. You're gonna go away to school and you have to stand on your own two feet. And so away I went to, to Luther College in Iowa. And so when you, when you think of that, um, Many of the things that surround higher education have changed. However, many things have stayed the same. When you think about a class period, you know, it's pretty much standard 50 minutes. When you think about faculty members teaching in those sections, still pretty much the same. So when you think about the structure of higher education, 
much of that's remained the same, but I'm, I'm going to suggest today that it's going to evolve quickly um, and change quickly. Um, when you think about the first university um, in the world, that, that was in 1859, and that was an uh, institution in Morocco. And then we go from Morocco to Bologna in 1088. University of Oxford founded in 1096. And of course, the first university in the United States was, answer please. Second, Harvard in 1650. And so when you look at higher education in the United States, we really kind of started based upon the classical university, which was formed in Europe and really formed the, the classical education of recitation, um, of memorization, of oral arguments. And it was really to, you know, kind of educate um, philosophers, um, theologians, um, and about the law, right? And so when you, when you think of kind of the classical education that was started in Harvard, you think about the same things. Um, and you think about what that was for. It was to prepare the leaders of this new world, the colony, right? And so when you think of that, you need to kind of think about that. One of the things that um, Dr. John Jacobson, who was the uh, uh, 10th president um, of Hope College would often say, when you look at higher education, the longevity of higher education is amazing. And, and, and he is correct. I mean, when you think of companies, they come and go. How many of us remember Wang? Anybody remember Wang? It was the word processing system before the computer, they're out of business. When you think of what General Electric used to be, where are they today? When you think of Firestone tires, where are they today? They've all been subsumed into different things. Higher education though, continues to you know, kind of move forward in time. Um, when you look at um, the evolution of kind of education from about 1650 to about 1850, um, it was the classical form of education. And the classical form of education would be these small classes, not unlike this, where you'd have a master that would be in front. It was mainly for men at the time, very few women, very few people outside the elite. Um, many of the classes were held in Latin or Greek. Um, and it was really to kind of help people understand how to be, how to govern. And around 1850, um, we began to shift in terms of our world and our, our situation, and, and we began to become in an industrialized country, right? And so when you think of the industrialized countries, that's also when we began to see how education shifted from just dealing with the classics to those things of engineering, mathematics, um, sciences beyond astronomy, because astronomy was a really an important thing. When you look at classical learning, it's the astronomy, the world, um, into chemistry and biology and things like that. So you begin to see this evolution around 1850, and what does that look like? Every, every university, and there were several at the time, um, really created their own structure um, and created their own um, sense of what, what um, let's see if this works. Am I doing the right thing? I think I am. No, I guess I'm not. So I have no idea. I'll let our Amanda do this. So, so for me, I think, you know, that's one of those big shifts when you think of the evolution. And so for me, the evolution of kind of higher education really is in 1850, you began seeing that every institution had a different structure and a different way it did it. So there's a lot of um, differences between institution to institution. Um, in 1865, the Morrill Act was passed. Um, and the Morrill Act really was set up to perform land grant institutions. And so when you begin thinking about Michigan State, when you think about Penn State, you know, you think about, you know, Iowa State, these were these institutions that were really there to help the agrarian society, right? Um, it was really, we're still agrarian. So what do we do? We find colleges and we set aside land and we give them grants and they start the moral act. You know, and so when you look at that again, so we begin seeing the evolution of what that is um, and what does that establish? And so that, that continues on for a while. 
And then in, in uh, 1901, you have your first um, community college in Chicago, um, founded by William Rainey Harper, um, which was really kind of the recognition that we needed to have something different. Um, and then in 1906, this is really interesting, is, is that in 1906, this was um, the first time we had a, a standard measure of learning. And this was the Carnegie um, committee that did this. And they said one credit hour um, equals a 50 minute class period. And that 50 minute class period, if it met three times a week, it will either be three or four credits. Oh, you know, I think that still resonates with most of us is that when you think of when you went to college, you, you would have a 50 minute class. And if you had a science class, it probably had that same 50 minute class. And then you had a three or four hour lab, you know, and that was that structure. And so the other thing that it set out was that every student will come at the college in the fall and do semester by semester and have the summer off just like so they can go back to the farm, right? That is the method that higher education formed in in the early nine, 1900s and is still still here today in 2022. Is, is that if we walk across the street, the hope right now is our curriculum is based upon 50 minute class periods. We're shifting from three credits to four credits next year for some accreditation things, but it's three, three credits for 50 minutes and it's time and seat. Right, so that's the other thing is, is that it's the time and the seat that we're measuring. It's that we're expecting to say that every student that comes is gonna learn in the same way. And so those are the kinds of things to think about. Um, there was relatively low numbers of people that went through higher education. Very few people really took advantage of higher education and that changed dramatically when the GI Bill happened, right? And when the GI Bill hat came back is that any person any white person and any white men were able to give the GI Bill. And so when you begin thinking about myself or my father, my father was a World War II veteran, he was able to be the recipient of that. And so he was privileged um, only because he was a white male and he was able to kind of continue. And so when you see the kind of the golden age of higher education in the United States, it really starts with that, with that GI Bill. And when you think of the influx of people that came into um, institutions across the United States and the building of institutions that really formed there. And then the second kind of thing that happened is in 1947 is when the federal government began giving grants and loans. And so when you think of financial aid, you think of the financial aid, the importance of it, those are the things that really happened. The GI Bill and then the federal, federal aid. Um, and then when you look at that from 1990, 90, 1944 to 1990, you know, higher education is lost. You know, when you think of um, Michigan State, when you think of Hope College, when you think of all the institutions that we have today, that was the heyday, right, of growth, um, both in terms of the number of faculty, uh, certainly the, the proliferation of programs, certainly the development of the research institution as we know it today. Um, certainly when you, when you look at those kinds of things, that's what happened. Clark Kerr really was instrumental in California when you look at kind of the formation of kind of the master plan for higher education. You have the University of California, you have the state universities, and then you have the community colleges. That really was kind of the seminal thing that we, we look at in higher education as kind of the, one of the great, you know, treasures beyond the Ivy Leagues that said higher education is going to be this, right? And so when you look at the history of higher education, we really stayed relatively the same you know, um, since 1906, when the Carnegie Commission says, this is how we're going to organize education. And everybody's going to fall into that kind of situation. So now you say, what is the reality of higher education in 2022? I think I'm going to propose that it's dramatic. It's going to be dramatically different kind of going forward. Um, when you look at just the percentages of those students that are attending colleges um, and universities today, is that, you know, if you just look at 1990, 80% were white, 9% black, 6% Hispanic, 4% Asian, and 1% multiracial or other. When you look at 2020, 54% is white, 13 black, 20% Hispanic, 8% Asian, and 5% multiracial. What does that mean? It means that we have tremendous difference coming to colleges today than we had just, you know, just a few short years ago. 20 years, 
And so when you begin thinking about what does that mean in terms of how we teach, how we think, how we how our cultures are formed, how we live into this, it's dramatically different. And so just the demography of the students that are coming. On top of that, when you begin looking at the birth rates, the birth rates are really fascinating. Um, there's a book, and I at the end of it, I have a slide that shares Nathan Graw is a faculty member at uh, Carleton College, and he wrote uh, kind of a, this seminal work about some of the things that are going on in, in um, the demography, the, the demographic and the demand for higher education. But when you look at since, since 2000, Hispanics, the population has grown by 56% for Hispanics, and non-white has grown by 8.3%. Ooh. When you look at the demand for 18 year olds, when you look at 2025, the number of college age students in 2025 is gonna to decrease totally by 650. The number that go to college is gonna decrease by 450,000. So we are just a few, three years from there and we're gonna have this precipitous drop in 18 year olds. And that ties right back to 2008 when the Great Recession happened. There's a dramatic downturn in the birth rates of, 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 for all people. Where birth rates are growing up though is the Hispanic population as well as the Asian population. So when you, when you look at birth rates, they have a direct effect on that. When you think of first generation students, these are students whose families have not had any college experience or their families have not, um, or only one person in their family has gone but not completed it. And so when you look at first generation students in 2015, 24% had parents with no post in deck secondary education. 56 did not have parents with a bachelor's degree. 59% were the first siblings. And so again, you have a different type type of student going. You also have a different family structure with students going. And I think that's the thing. In some ways, these families that are coming now, and I can share with you just last week, I was met, meeting with a student who is a first generation student from Dallas, Texas, single parent, um, never went to college. And he says, I don't belong. He cannot see himself in college. His native language is Spanish. His mother does not speak Spanish. So what is that like for him now then as a first generation student to come to a place that's not what he sees and not what now what he understands. So when you begin thinking that this is the population that we're going to increasingly enroll, what does that mean for how we do education? And how do we step into that? What's fascinating now is when you look at the influx of women into education, it's significant. There are more women in higher education than there are men. As of November 21, 39% of women 25 and older have a bachelor's degree compared to men with 37%. For women 25 to 35, though, years of age, 40%, 46% of the women have a bachelor's degree degree as compared to only 36% for men. So when you look at what's happening in higher education is that women are getting their bachelor's degrees at a much higher rate than men are. So what does that mean for the sociology of the community? What does that mean for the family structure? What does that mean for work and the work environment? All those things are things now we have to be thoughtful about in terms of that. Cost of colleges. Um, private uh, average tuition in 2001 was 24,000. In 2020, just uh, 20 short years later, it's almost, uh, it's 37,650. I mean, when, when Bob talked earlier about his, what the tuition was for, for, for when he went to school, you know, and you begin looking at this, what does this mean? I mean, you can begin understanding the magnitude of the increase. When, when you look at the publics, it's doubled. You know, and so when you begin thinking about what does this 
cost of going to school mean, it is even higher. The average debt uh, for students, let's see if I got that. Um, I, let's see if I got it on this one. The average debt for student in 2019 for a private student coming out was almost was 33,000 and for public was 27,000. Indebtedness. I mean, we all know what debt means. We all have had mortgages, right? We all, we all had to pay car payments. Can you imagine being 22 years old and having debt of $33,000? Can you imagine what that means for them and what that looks like? And, and how do they get ahead when they're trying to do debt, paying rent, and all these other kinds of things, right? You know, So the cost of higher education is, is, is out of reach for many people. When you look at what colleges and universities are doing, they're trying to reduce their tuition or freeze their tuition, and now they're, now they're discounting or giving grants. You know, I think what Hope is trying to do with President Scogan is trying to kind of raise enough money so that it, that it can be accessible by everybody. You know, the difficult part is, is that when you go back to that earlier slide of the first generation, many of those students are working full time. And they're sending that money back to their families. Last year, we were working with another group of students and they were saying, we're taking 16 hours, we're working between eight and 12 hours, and mom and dad are saying the money comes to us. So when you look at all those, those checks that came from the COVID relief money, most of those checks for many of our students did not stay with us or stay with our students, they sent back, were sent back to their family. So you begin to understand that there's this really different economic driver here too, right? And so what does that economic driving look like when you have students having this kind of debt going out and they're starting jobs and many of those jobs, when you think of, for example, of a teaching job, you know, the average teacher salary is gonna be between 45 and 50,000 to start, you know, and they're trying to make payments on that and they're trying to pay rent and they're trying to have a car and they're trying to do all these other kinds of things. So I think that impacts the mental health. So when you when you look at the mental health of a student or a graduate, it, it impacts their mental health. It impacts their ability to purchase homes. It impacts whether they can get married. It impacts the size of family and it will impact them for many, many years to come. There are some students, I was with a student uh, recently um, who's 40 and they, all, they said, we will be making our last payment on our student debts in January of 2023. You know, that's, that's a lot of years. That's a lot of years. And particularly if you've not chosen a profession that is highly compensated. You know, so you have to be you have to be thinking about those kinds of things. When you look at student debt totally, is in 2010, it was $850 million. Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, what is the impact of community college surge right now on higher education? And do you see uh, students coming out of high school who are looking, saying, mm -hmm. if I could just get uh, two more years mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, an, in an associate's degree, mm -hmm. uh, what will that do for, for me moving forward? Mm -hmm. there, is, there is some increase in community college um, enrollment. What we found, particularly in these last two years with COVID, is community college was hit the most, is most of those students did not continue on because most of those students who go to community colleges are those first generation students or those students with a lot of, with not a lot of cultural connections to higher education or education beyond uh, high school at, at all. And so there is some um, benefit by going to community college and certainly we, we see some of those people going on and going that way. 
but the college experience as presented by us as a society really is a four-year experience of going on from high school into college. The other piece, and I left my phone in the car, is, is that if you look at phones of students who are seniors, their pictures that they have on their Facebooks and all the things that they see is a four-year experience. You very rarely will see that translate into community college experience. So there's a stigma, I think, of going to community college still, right? And so when you think of what we, what we hold up, um, we only have to look at the experience of when the University of Michigan wins a national title, that their enrollment goes right out the window, right? Or when you have those kinds of things, that is what people perceive college should be. It, we have not done a good job um, within, I think, the high school system to say those are valued things, right? I think the other piece that's going on for me right now is that I think families and students are really saying, is my indebtedness of $33,000 or $28,000 uh, worth that investment? Can I get a different kind of education, meaning a trades or something else and go on and do that and not assume all these debts? And so I think you begin seeing some different kinds of things that are going on going with community college. We have a comment and a question online. The first comment is from Gary. He said, my grandson graduated from University of Virginia with $23,000 in student debt, but to get the master's in DPT required to become a physical therapist, he had to incur an additional $210,000 in debt. This is a staggering burden. And the next question is from Bill. He says, I would love to hear the presenter's ideas about such things as the definite left-leaning bent of most college professions today, the cancel culture and political correctness of today's campuses, and the requirement to have safe places where controversial issues cannot be discussed. Um, so I want to do two things. One is when you look at graduate school and graduate degrees, you're absolutely right. The thing that's fascinating is those are often driven by accreditation. So I think what he was referring to is I think his grand grandchild got a doctorate of physical therapy. If you look at physical therapy, at one point in time, you could get a master's in physical therapy and not be required to get a doctorate. And so the accreditation institute says you now must go and get get a doctor and so it's fascinating to see how sometimes these professions kind of manipulate what they want for their own self-interest right and so those are some different kinds of things but um it is absolutely true there is very little scholarship money going on to graduate school you know so when you look at that within the sciences there's research fellowships that they give them but when you look at medical school or law school or these other, there's very little. So the amount of indebtedness that a graduate student is going to, to take on is, is significant. I have three children of my own. Um, and when, when they did the calculus on whether it was worth stepping out of the workforce and going to graduate school, they looked at that kind of calculus and said, it could be a loss of up to $400,000 when you look at that. And so whatever job they take is going to have to make up that incremental difference. That is really a challenge, right? The second question was about the left-leaning uh, tendency of kind of higher education. That I'd like to get into that. That's kind of a whole different topic, I think. It really has to do with the culture of a college and university. So I think there is... Um, some really interesting conversations around that. Having been a dean of students, I, I was often sitting in a chair between two um, different positions um, that I had, um, and I do think that there's some legitimacy that that um, higher education has always been more liberal than conservative, um, but I think there's reasons for that as well. Um, so I'll, I'd like to talk to that, but I have more things that I got to get through to, to get through my, my presentation. So if I have time, I'll, I'll be happy to come back to that. But when you look at that indebtedness, you know, when you think of that and then you think about, okay, when you think about $1.65 trillion and then you begin thinking about, 
are these young people are going to be able to pay it off? You know, and that goes to Bob's point is, is that's why there is interest in loan forgiveness. But is that the right answer? I don't know if that's the right answer. Um, because I can tell you there are many families that sacrificed to send their child through school and did not do things like take out debt because they sacrificed. So what about those families? You know, and so we have to think thoughtfully about this and I'm not saying I'm yes or I'm not saying I'm no, but I'm saying that the financial burden coupled with the demographic difference is significant today. When you look um, at the organization and the culture, um, so when you think back to you know the Great Recession of 2008, that's when things started shifting for higher ed. You know it was it was growing and doing great things, and 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 when you began thinking about it, that's when cutbacks began to happen. Um, federal funding was reduced, state funding was reduced. When you think about student preparation in high schools has changed with the increasing difference in demography. So when you begin thinking about how we teach is that we take a class that is very different in abilities and say, we're going to teach the same way to all of those students. So how do you teach to excellence when there is that kind of difference? You know, and I think what higher education or high schools have said is everyone's equal, so we're going to teach the same way. Well, if there are some persons that are capable, then they ought to go as fast as they can. Others can't go that fast. So again, when you begin thinking about what does that mean when those students kind of come out of high school, is many of those students when, you know, I'm teaching a class now, is that of the students that I teach, 50% of them have already taken AP classes or have taken classes at Hope or another institution, higher ed institution already. So what's happening is even within high schools is that that educational experience is changing. Higher education's complexity has changed tremendously. So when you begin thinking about higher education and what, what it was, my dad started teaching at Michigan State University in 1949. It was a fairly easy thing to navigate. Um, when you look at it today, the the joy of teaching i think has been taken out from many faculty yes richard going back to your uh, point about student preparation um, we see more and more stories about uh, college and universities not requiring the sat or the act what do you think about that yeah, i mean i think the sat and act are not the only measure you know so for example if you really look at some of the data, I think that, you know, um, Dr. Dersham could talk about too, is that we can look at high schools and high school preparation programs and the kind of preparation that they do in high school and begin developing modeling that would allow students to be successful. So an SAT or an ACT really is a time test to see how well you do on a time test in a given period of time. You know, I think that's one of the things that's really interesting when you look at the testing Testing as a business is L, um, the LSAT, um, the MCAT, um, the GMAT, which is the graduate uh, for business. Many of those are time tests to see how well you think quickly. It does not mean you don't, can't do the work, but it means you may not be able to do that work in that time period. And so for me, I do not believe that the ACT or the SAT is the only measure one should use. You know is that there's other measures you can use. When I worked um, at Michigan State, Michigan State has enough of a database that they could say a student from West Ottawa High School who takes this curriculum, who has this GPA, will achieve this GPA at Michigan State because they have enough of a sample size that they can do that. You know, So it's those kinds of things that I think you gotta take a look at. Um, I think that the other part for me is that with the complexity of higher education, um, when I think of the number of roles faculty are expected to play, it's significant. Faculty are now expected to be advisors to students. They're expected to be counselors, not a, not a professional counselor, but a counselor of sorts for students. 
They're expected to be participants in faculty governance. They're expected to do service to the college. They're expected to hold a research program and do research, and they're expected to teach. So when you think of the burden that faculty carry today, it's a very different burden than when my dad started teaching. You know, my brother was in the faculty, Bob was in the faculty, my brother law was on the faculty. When their career started, their career was de dedicated to teaching. That's what they that's what they love, and that's what they did. That no longer is the case, right? And so when you begin thinking about that, I'm concerned with the kind of faculty we're going to get. I think there's fewer opportunities for advancement within institutions. I think with the compression, there's, there, there's, there's less money, um, departments are smaller, um, and it becomes a situation where if you're not gonna be able to advance to other places or other schools, it's harder, right? Um, Faculty and have increased in diversity, requiring adjustments and learning to understand and, and longstanding privileges, right? So when you think of faculty today, it's a very much more diverse pool, right? But what does that look like, right? It was very easy when everybody was homogenous. You know, so when you look at most uh, yearbooks dating back, it was all white men. So what happened when women started coming in? I can tell you right now that within some sciences, it's still hard. When you think of computer science as a discipline, what happens when you don't see faculty that are different? They're all white men. We, 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 have, we have very few African-Americans or Hispanic mathematicians. What does that say? You know, and when you have one, what does that mean then when you have a department? How do you manage that? How do you do that? 10 years is eroding. There's, you know, every year there's, there's fewer people that are getting tenured. Tenure is, is something that is not as strong as it used to be. And so when you look at that, what does that mean? What does that mean for the, for the psychological sense of safety, for academic freedom? Um, what does that mean for lifelong? You know, when my dad worked, he was tenured, my brother was tenured. Um, they could do that and they knew that they could stay at their institutions for as long as they wanted. Currently, that's not the case. I mean, currently, when you look at schools, programs are being done away with. I think boards um, are asserting themselves. State governments are asserting themselves. Um, since 2015, 70 schools have either closed or merged, right? So when you think of colleges and universities, 70 students have closed or merged. And I think the big, the other part for me is, is that when you look at the kind of intrusions right now, COVID required students to pause and consider different forms of learning, right? So when you begin thinking about what happened with COVID, you know, all of a sudden now they can learn on the computer, they can learn different ways. So when you begin thinking about what are these organizational cultural things that have changed from higher dramatically, it's, it's dramatic the difference between what was and what is. And then you look at the explosion in technology. And I think for me, you know, one of the, the key things, if you look at down in the fifth bullet, it says in 2021, there are 1.8 million articles published in economics. 1 million, article, 1 million medical articles published. This is an article being published every minute and a half. The explosion is the same in every field. How do we make sense of this kind of knowledge explosion? How do we, how do faculty, how does any of us uh, absorb this in a way which we then can be be capable to understand it all. Um, when I was preparing for this, um, it's absolutely amazing the number of articles that you can kind of read on all these subjects, right? But what does that mean for knowledge? I mean, how do we understand that? How do we aggregate it? How do we organize it? How do we teach it, right? When you have this kind of explosion. When you think of, um, if you go over to the basement of, um, of the SCOP Science Center, if you ever get a chance, you can go in there as a nursing department and they have seven different mannequins that they can control computer-wise that can put that mannequin through any and, any and all expectations of, of an illness or a seizure or a heart attack. Whereas before it was on, you never could do that, right? So when you think about the explosion of knowledge, it's so different than when I went through school. I mean, it's like it's like simulations. When you go to medical school, they now have those fancy goggles that you can put on 
They, they actually can practice surgeries, you know, on these highly sophisticated things and you're never touching a body at all. When you go to Michigan State Med School and I talk to some of our former graduates that go there, most of their learning their first year is not with this faculty member at all. It's all self-taught. What does that say? I mean, so the explosion of knowledge is just mushroomed itself into so many different forms that we never even thought about, right? And so when you think of that, you know, there's greater connect connectivity, you know? So when you think of um, the ways in which we talk to one another and we work together across institutions, right? I think that's that other thing. So a faculty member at Hope could easily be doing a work with a faculty member in Turkey or easily be doing a, a faculty member working across the United States, right? And so what does that mean when you have these different kinds of opportunities? There's an, but there's an explosion of knowledge. Um, so I think, you know, for me, when I look at this, this is really exciting. Um, right now, there's a student that's working um, down at uh, Purdue University, and he's developing sophisticated models on deer wasting. So he's taking all the data from um, the state of Indiana on deer wasting, and he's putting it into a computer model, and, he, and he's projecting. You know, I, and I don't know how that works. But you begin thinking about what does that mean? Salesforce, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Salesforce. Salesforce is this group. They have so much customer information on so many people that they develop these highly sophisticated algorithms that will begin predicting what things happen and when they happen, right? They're looking at healthcare equity. They're looking at all these kinds of learning things. So when you think of knowledge, you, we have to think of knowledge differently than we did before. Um, then the other part for me is the different models of higher education. In 1976, there are 76 for-profit educational institutions. In 2019, there are 742. So, so you just look at that as, a, as, as what's going on, as, as what does that mean and, and how does that look? You know, you think of University of Phoenix as that one that we all probably have heard of. You know, that's just one of 742. And so you have all these different ones. The other one was DeVry and DeVry was out of Minnesota and it was a highly sophisticated kind of technical school um, which trained all sorts of technical and they were very successful. And so when you look at that, Coursera, how many of you have taken a course from Coursera, right? Um, and these are some of the best schools in the world. You can take a course from the University of Peking, right? Beijing, I mean, it would be amazing, right? Yale. I mean, um, there's a course at Yale that's taught um, the, about happiness. It's one of the most subscribed courses in the United States. It's great. You know, I've hopped on and taken some classes myself. But you can get a certificate if you'd like, right? Google Information Certificate is a four or five part series, right? And that's the other side that people have an access to. AT&T tried to go to traditional education at Georgia Tech. They found that the courses that were being taught at Georgia Tech were not what they needed. So they worked with Georgia Tech and they have their own program now. So they have in fact, not taken, not gone into the traditional mode of Georgia Tech. They said, we're gonna go beyond you Georgia Tech, but we want you to certify. Georgia Tech now certifies. Amazon University develops internships and employment opportunities for college graduates. MoMA, Museum of Modern Art in New York City has a class on uh, post-war abstract painting, which has 70 classes, charges $49 a month, has 44,000 students. Yale uh, Alumni Academy online classes, ASP. You, all of you, you know, your model is different, right? So when you look at the models of higher education that are presenting themselves, it is exponentially growing quicker and more diverse. And I think the question for me, or one of the questions for me is that if one of the very prestigious institutions, Stanford University, were to say, we're going to take our bachelor's degree online and you can earn an online bachelor's degree from Stanford University with all rights and privileges therein. And we're going to charge you one fourth of what it would cost for you to be on campus. Would you attend? That's, that's, a, that's an interesting question because I think, you know, when I'm looking at many of the young people today, that's what they're going to look for, right? 
So um, where is high, higher education evolving? I think change is a given and, and it will be disruptive. I mean, there's no question when I think of higher education that, that higher education as we have known it, um, as we sit here to, to get there today together, is that it's gonna change. There will be a segment of colleges and universities that are elite, that there are ones endowed niche institution they'll survive, but their profile will be modified. So when you think of the Ivy League schools and you think of those institutions, when you look at the large R1s and research institutions, they'll, they'll largely say, stay the same. When you think of some of the small institutions that have a niche base or a faith based or some things like that, I think they will survive, but they'll need to change. There's gonna be increasing uh, tension between internal members of the academy and the external forces. I think when you think of students, when you think of parents, when you think of foundations, when you think about government and accreditation, um, I mean, it, it, it is going to change. Um, this morning, I was reading the Chronicle um, of, of Higher Education. Um, and one of the things is that uh, Montclair State and Bloomfield College, which in Bloomfield College is in New Jersey, is founded in 1868, has 1,200 students. They've just announced that they're merging with Montclair State University of New Jersey. So Bloomfield State will become a subsidiary of Montclair State. In the same article, on October 30th, the Board of Trustees of Michigan State University, my alma mater, had, had a, had a had a really rancorous uh, meeting because of the way in which they treated uh, former President Stanley, who was just forced to resign. So when you think about board intrusion, when you think about um, the issues of appointing a significant faculty member to a prestigious position at University of North Carolina a year ago, and she was involved with the 2016 project uh, of the New York Times, she was denied that. When you think of what's going on in Florida and you're looking at the curriculum development or the lack of curriculum development, you look at that. So when you begin thinking about how state governments are beginning to say, okay, what you can and can't teach, what you will or will not do, you know, the intrusion that's going to happen and how this is going to shape things is important. When you think about the Gates Foundation, where does the Gates Foundation put their money? You know, where does the Amazon family put their money? You know, so when you begin thinking about foundations, foundations are beginning to manipulate things. When you think about uh, Mr. Bloomberg, Mr. Bloomberg gave um, John Hopkins University $100 million. And he intends to give more. Amazing. Amazing. But that's going to shift and, and it's going to change. Technology. And I want you to hear the iPhone. The iPhone, the iPhone was first uh, developed in what year? 2007. So when you think in 2007 and you look at today, what does that mean? When you look at your phone, you can get anything you want on your phone, can't you? And what does that mean? That means you want it now, when you want it, how you want it, and where you want it. So when you look at technology and you look at the iPhone and access will demand education become more accessible, nimble, and available when the consumer wants it. Consumers will not tolerate time and seats or prescribed curriculum. Rather than want education anytime, anywhere, any place. You know, that's kind of what we want, right? That's kind of what, you know, when I look at my kids, that's how they live their lives, right? <clears throat> they want to go somewhere, they call an Uber. You know, they want to get food, they DoorDash. You know, when they want to watch a movie, they get a movie. When they want to take a class, they'll take a class. You know, so those are things that are really shifting and changing. Competition for students and resources will accelerate as more forms of education are developed. When you, so when you look at that traditional model of education that we're used to, you know, that's gonna be competing with those for-profit organizations. It's gonna be competing with these online organizations as well. And so when you begin thinking about that, and then you begin looking at the demography of people, is that the, the growth of population that is first generation is gonna be growing at a higher rate than the traditional white population will be. More of them are gonna not have the accessibility to education as, as we currently know it. So they may have to follow that model of using things differently. 
Um, ling le learning will no longer be singularly focused on learning to gather seat time, being with faculty member. Education will be innovative in teaching, developing outcomes and ability to do the work. Individuals learn differently and need pedagogy, which allows for difference. And perhaps that's one of the most important things is that every one of you in this room learns differently and has different abilities and different skills. I never was really good at math. Bob was really good at that, you know? But if we were sitting in the same class together, I would have to go at one pace. That would be far too slow for Bob, you know? But we're taught the same way. So some way we have to find the ability to kind of allow ourselves to have different modalities, different pedagogy, which allows people to kind of do things differently. You know, and this is this transition from this industrial style economy, education, excuse me, where it's like an assembly line. Everybody comes in together, everybody goes out together. What it's going to be is, is that everybody starts, but make end in different places or different spaces, depending upon their abilities, right? Um, equity will demand greater access as the population shifts and change uh, both from the way to learn and the affordability. By 2045, the minority will be white, will be at 49%. And so when you think about what does that mean, that means the majority is going to be Hispanic, <coughs> African-American, Asian, and multiracial, right? So when you begin looking at what higher education is going to look like, our access points are gonna to have to look very different than they are today. And it's, we're gonna to have to kind of do that. Degrees will become part of the landscape of recognized achievement, but will not hold a monopoly. To date, I think our degrees have hold, held a monopoly. You know, um, I think going forward, it's not gonna be that. Um, when you think of coding, um, you can get a coding certificate and you can go and get a job paying $25 an hour. You know, you don't need to go to college anymore. When you look at Ernst & Young, IBM, Apple, Nordstrom, Bank of America, and numerous other organizations, they no longer require a degree. So what, is it, what does that say? You know, you don't have to have that degree. College campuses will need to become innovative with their physical spaces they may have overbuilt and are left with empty real estate. So you think of a college campus and you look at all the buildings we have, what are we gonna do with those buildings if we don't have students? When we look at schools in the state of Michigan, there's only three institutions last year that filled their, filled their classrooms. One was U of M, second one was Michigan, and the third one was Hope. You know, when you look at our friends at Calvin, they have struggled. When you look at Alma, they have struggled. And this is not to say anything about them as institutions. It is to say that the demography of the state of Michigan is really reducing. When you look at demography in the Midwest and the Northeast, our demography is going to go right off the table. We're gonna drop 15% in 2025. Where do we get most of our students from? 65% of our students come from, from Michigan. And so when you begin thinking about that, what does that mean? You know, and so when you look at that Northeast corridor, I was talking to a student right now who's out at Harvard, that's one of our former students. He says, they're just as nobody gets married out here and they're not having kids. I mean, he says, it's profoundly different than what I understood my experience in Michigan to be, right? So when you look at birth rates, that makes a huge difference in terms of that. When you look at Otterbein, Otterbein did something really, really, really clever, is that they built this really wonderful engineering building, but what they then did is they invited local engineering firms to, to take space in that engineering building with them, pay them rent, they take their students then, and they become the employees of these engineering firms. And so they're teaching and doing. Fascinating. One reason I know that is one of our former students is Teach is one of the faculty members there. But that's really innovative, isn't it? It's really creative in terms of trying to figure that out. So, um, you know, so for me, I think that's, that's, that's part of the things that we're gonna have to change. My conclusions are this. Higher education is a process of learning, developing and expanding knowledge, and knowledge, sharing and shaping culture and providing a path forward will always exist and it will be different. 
higher education has been present for over a thousand years. If you remember that first university in 1885 or 885, and but it was always being evolving and relevant. Technology accelerates the need to change in ways that we are not always clear about or understand the ramifications requiring a renewed commitment to ethical thinking and behavior. I mean, I think that's that other piece is technology is great, but we really need to think about what are the ethics and the behavior as a consequence of technology. You know, when we think about, for example, all the information that floats out there and all the things that we know about one another, we really need to understand that. Each of us will, will, will need to realize that we'll need to be lifelong learners. For all of you, you get that already. But for young people, that's more important. They're going to need to understand that. Our work and our lives will our work and the lives we live are constantly evolving and either we evolve with them or we become less relevant. We should always be connected to a learning community formally or informally. And, and, and then the last thing for me is change is a given. My, my quotes are is, is that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. Albert Einstein, right? You know, we cannot solve this problem by what we have thought. We have to think differently. We have to think innovatively. We have to think creatively. And change is a threat when done to me, but an opportunity when done by me. And that's by Rosemary Beth Kanner, who was a faculty member at Harvard. And I think that's the part that's most important to me is, is higher education really needs to make, make a commitment to say, we are going to be different and we're going to be different quickly. Because if we're not going to become different quickly, we're going to become irrelevant. And so just as the phone has become that place that we now all go to, you know, higher education that can change overnight. This is a book by Levine and Van Pelt. Um, it's 2021. Um, it, it is eloquent. It really kind of um, um, goes through everything um, that I've kind of talked about. Um, but it's, it is, um, it, there's an uncertain future um, for higher education if we don't change. When you think, for example, at NIL, right? name, image, likeness for athletes, right? And you now have athletes um, at major programs and you have boosters paying 20,000 more a student athlete. What does that mean for them, right? What does that look like for us, right? When you look at some of these large athletic programs. So, yes. We have a question online from Jackie. The question is, what do you believe the Supreme Court decision will impact will have on all higher ed institutions, the decision on Harvard and UNC admissions. Will there be a shift in admissions at colleges? So Harvard and, and um, University of North Carolina have been sued because um, they believe to have discriminated against um, students of Asian background. I think the Supreme Court will side with those students and they're gonna throw affirmative action and um, using race in any form, shape out the window. Um, I think again, for me, I'd say what we need to do is think thoughtfully about how we respond as an educational institution in terms of what are those metrics we use to admit students by. And there's other ways to admit students by. It also depends upon where you recruit. And so, you know, one of the things that, that um, you can try to do is develop feeding systems or feeder systems from institutions that have profiles that would match your profile. Um, but there should not be just, um, and I think the other side to that same question is that if you look at many of the Ivy League schools, is that they are being pushed very hard right now to do away with all legacy admits. So legacy admits is the same for, as race admits, right? Is, is that a legacy admit is, is that if I went to Harvard, therefore my kids get to go to Harvard. That's gonna probably be thrown out shortly too. So I think both those things will probably be thrown out. But higher education has been that um, experience for the people um, in America that has really provided the greatest ways for people to move forward economically um, and socially. I mean, that is the thing we need to protect, right? Is how can vary, 
But that learning of that knowledge is really important. And it's the outcome of that that's really important, right? And so when you look at technology and how rapidly things are changing, um, coding being one of those examples, the Google um, technology certificate's another one, is that those people are in high demand. And so the more we can find our ways into those things with some other kinds of broad-based cultural experiences, the better off we're going to be, right? Because you can't just, you can't just um, do the technical side and not the people side for me. You know, um, my dad's first job when he finished his doctorate was working at MIT. And his responsibility was to teach engineers how to be people without a textbook. He was a, he was a clinical psychologist. And so that's that piece for me that education has also done. It's that socialization, right? So how do we live together differently? How do we work together differently? That's the piece that I worry about, right? The more we can stay within our own phone, right? Then we create our own community. Those communities don't work real well when you have to go outside that. So that's the dilemma for me is, is that when I look at the kinds of experiences that I've lived in my life, is that education has brought me in touch with so many different people. And what I'm concerned about is, is that when you look at some of these, these online experiences and these other kinds of experiences, is that that part is narrowed down and there's not nearly the kind of interaction between people. And so how do we live with one another through difference when we don't have those experiences of exploring difference? Yes. I'm so glad that you got to that point because I think we are so siloed in so many ways. And if we continue to be, how are we going to learn to listen to other points of view, to learn more broadly? If there aren't some standards, I think it's a possible advantage to have what we might call programmed learning that would end up with an achievement or a, mm -hmm. an assessment of broad knowledge. Of, but it seems to me that's a concern. Mm -hmm. Another question is, how is hope going to do with hope forward under these new changing um, terms? Uh, I mean, I have to be really careful here. I mean, I think one of the things, Dr. Dursum, Dr. I mean, and so part of it for me is, is that I think from my standpoint, the curriculum is really important to be innovative. When I think of, uh, of um, how we, so um, curriculums need to evolve quicker and, and not have the hurdles that it currently has. So one would be an innovative curriculum. So I think there's one. Um, you know, I think the second thing is, is that with you have Hope Forward, I think we are enough, enough of a niche institution that I think the kinds of things that the college provides with both faith and, and, and learning is, is another one of those things. I think we're, 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 in, a, we're in a good position. I think the, 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 third, the third thing for me is, is that when you look at what Dr. Van Wyland did when he became the president, the ninth president, is what he really did is he brought the collaborative experience. And I think that collaborative experience is going to serve us well going forward. I think what we need to do though, is figure out how do we do that collaborative experiences across the curriculum and not so much in computer science, engineering and sciences is we need to have these collaborative experiences. For example, when you look at teacher education, we do really well because we have it there. When you look at the nursing program, we really do that well there. But it's that collaborative opportunity. So how do we do that with political science, right? How do we do that with sociology? How do we do that with psychology? How do we do that with the arts, right? Those are things that if you have those experiences, then you're both and. And so I think that's the piece for me is really trying to find ways to be collaborative. Is it likely that small is beautiful? Because you can have more of that collaboration and understanding of different viewpoints and different cultural backgrounds. Right, and, right. Okay. Right. I mean, I think small, I mean, I, I think in, in, so, you know, one of the, one of the interesting questions is, is that one of the things that we have done in higher education is to say, you have to have a PhD to teach. Oh, that's interesting too, isn't it? You know? 
So a person who is, for example, maybe has gotten an MBA or a master's in social work and has 10 years of experience or 15 years of experience or a master's in nursing, should they be able to teach? Maybe they should be. You know, what, what, what's sacred about a PhD? You know, now I can be biased because I have one, but I also was privileged to be able to get one, right? But, but it should not negate someone's experience when they've done these things and been very successful at them and they have a love of teaching, right? There, there's nothing to say that we should require those kinds of things either. And I think sometimes what we do is we kind of get um, uh, elitist in terms of that and say, okay, and as an elite, you need to do that. But I can think of the number of students that I have known in my, my career at Hope, and I'd love to have them come back and teach, but I'm not sure that the faculty as a guild would want that. I think that's a very good point. I volunteer at Hope in the nursing department, and it depends with your degree what you're teaching. If you're in the skills lab, then someone has a baccalaureate or a master's, but they have the clinical expertise to relate to the student. Mm -hmm. And it's difference between lecturing in the classroom with a PhD as far as the content, but the actual experience. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the things I think I miss with COVID too. I think the nursing department is wonderful. I mean, they really stepped up to the plate when COVID came. But one thing you miss is when you have an online lecture as opposed when you're talking in class, because that's when you share with the faculty, their experiences and your experience, and, and you connect in a collaborative and a collegial way by understanding. And when you have an online lecture and you say the students watch the lecture or listen to it, then come to class, it's not the same interaction, especially things you don't understand and you want to ask specific questions. Sometimes it doesn't afford the opportunity for the student, but it's nothing about the pro, it's a wonderful program. But we had to, you know, we had to, COVID was, it was tough. And so you had to really be innovative in, in your program to keep it going, so. And I, and I think that that's one of the dilemmas, right? But I think yes, one, of the, it is. one of the hard parts for me in that is that, you know, my children would rather do 140 characters with me in a text than pick up the phone and dial my number. But that, but so that's that, that's that tension, isn't it? Between what, what they're used to and how they see the world and how I see the world, right? And so that's that, that's that bridge we have to kind of figure out how we do that together. And, and I think one of the most important things for me is that if you go back to that um, quote at the end, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them, right? We've created this problem. We have to have different thinking for how I work with my kids, right? That's the key, right? And so when you're teaching in, in that situation, does that mean then you have more of a Zoom, for example, um, with a different set of technologies where there's only eight of you that sit around that are nursing students and there's one of you and eight of them, they really get to ask those questions then, right? That may, that may look different, but it's gonna have to, it means we're gonna need to change. And I think for me, change is inevitable. I'm, I'm a different person today than I was yesterday, you know? So I think that's that's part of what higher education. And I think when you look at 1906 to 2022, we're basically the same institution. You know, when you look at your lifetime, rotary phones, typewriters. I mean, it's we're, we cannot let higher education stay in the state it is; otherwise, it will become obsolete. And and, and, and higher education is too important for many reasons um, to let that happen. But the time is now, we have to do it, we can't wait. I'm so bothered by the money. You know, the University of Michigan, $13 billion endowment, Harbaugh, the football coach with the $7 million, you know, it's, and then the kids mm -hmm. trying to get an education. Mm -hmm. I don't know enough about it to know, you know, if the graph that you showed of how expensive, but I know that my parents were teachers and they were able to get me through Michigan state mm -hmm. and I didn't have any student loans, you know? So what is ratcheting up? I understand what you said about the funding 
coming from the Fed in the state, but it it looks like there's money there. You go to these places and it all looks fancy and well, that's part of it, right? So when you so when you look at it, 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 it there is a there is a war of 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 ambiance that happens at universities. So if you look at Davidson, um, which is a very small prestigious school down in North Carolina, they have um, laundry service. So what does that say to me? You know, um, when you look at the food service and you look at the variety of foods that are now presented. There are certain things that have also had to increase. So for example, when I talk about the complexity, when you, so when Dr. Dershom started his career and I can ask him when he started it, but his role at that time really was to, 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 to work with students or, or that were, that, 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 that did not have the mental health problems that we have today, right? Um, that did not have the, the, uh, economic problems they have today that they they mainly came from white families when so when you look at higher education as a as a way in which we now work is is the faculty used to be the academic advisors they used to be the personal counselors they used to teach the classes they used to coach the teams hope for many years had a teacher coach model that no longer is there we have professional coaches so when you look at the complexity and the demands of what they're expected to do, they no longer can do that. So who does that? In comes the dean of students, in comes a counseling center staff, in comes a health center staff, in comes a career services staff. And so all these other things that support the student experience have been added on. And I'm not saying those are right or wrong, I'm just saying this has now become a cost of doing the business of the college. When you look at many of those large athletic contracts, for example, the one at Michigan State, for example, our friend, um, all of his salaries paid by outside money. You know, so his entire contract has been guaranteed by, I think it's the person that, that, that owns Quicken Loans, right? And so he says, here's $10 million a year to pay for the thing for me that that that's probably an, another byproduct of this is is that how many of us work during summers to go and support ourselves going to college? That was me. I mean, I worked at Michigan State Dairy Barns. That was me, milking cows, right? That's how I raise money every summer to pay for my school at Luther, right? Right now, parents know that it's more important for students to do two things. One is to take summer school classes so they get ahead of college credits. That's one thing to do. The other thing is they send them to these highly um, sophisticated athletic camps to get a college scholarship. They no longer work. So many of the students that come to college have not worked a job yet. So these are these experiences that have changed dramatically. And so there are, there are these expenses where colleges um, the escalating arms race, right? And so um, we're all trying to compete for the same students. So how do you compete? You get fancy buildings, you get fancy services, you get fancy, 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 right? It doesn't change the education as much, right? So at some point in time, we've really got to decide who we're going to be and what we're going to be. You have that one slide about the cost when you said uh, room and board was significant. So most colleges, what? You stay on the, the uh, campus a year or two years and everybody wants an apartment. Mm -hmm. So is that a significant loss of income to the college? And do some colleges require you to stay on campus for four years? Is that still something that- so when, so when you look at Michigan State, Michigan State only required freshmen to live on campus. They now just changed that to sophomores too because their buildings were empty. And so when you have empty buildings and all those buildings are paid for, what happens is, is that the auxiliary services, meaning room and board, support the academic program. So that's how they support that. At, at St. Olaf College, Carleton College, McAllister College, you'll live on campus all four years. All four years. Luther College, all four years. Hope College has said three years and you, you can leave. Now. Three for us, right? But now what could happen, so let, let's play it hypothetically, if we became smaller, we could certainly say everybody stays on campus for four years. 
but to date we we've stayed with three. You know, so I think you know I think that's the other side. So when you look at you know um, the athletic program at University of Michigan, you know I mean that's a that's a huge money maker for the college as well, right? You know, uh, and so there is some benefit to the college by having some of these programs. But I think the thing for me is that my concern, how does name, image, and likeness licensing for athletics help the ballerina or the bass player or the cornet player or the theater person, right? Are they not the same? Should they not have the same opportunities? Absolutely. So where's the equity there? You know, these are these these are these really important questions that that institutions have got to start grappling with because I think it is. I think parents are not going to just say we're just going to say it's okay to do that. I mean, I think that we're all reaching a point in life where those things are are going to be called into question and people are going to be asked to be held accountable. This brings up an important question. I did not go to college. I have two grandchildren. They're twins. They both go to Grand Valley. They only live 20 minutes away, so they are not living on campus, and they do have an evening job at UPS loading trucks. They have been chastised for not getting a real college education because they're not on campus. Is there a big difference between the two? I think it's a fair question. I think for me, I, I, I think every, every you know, all, all young people are different. So I can't say one is, is better than the other. What I can say is that when you look at the socialization that takes place for young people when they're with their peer group, that is a significant amount of interaction that they've got to navigate. And it shouldn't be a situation where they're chastised because they're not getting a real college experience. It is still a real college experience. The college experience is really the learning and the education that takes place, right? You know, it's the socialization piece, right? So if they have a strong group of friends, if they're going to the Grand Valley football games, right? If they're, if they're doing the kinds of things that other college students are doing, you know, um, then I think then that's fine. If they're involved with, you know, uh, you know, the Grand Valley has got some really interesting Christian organizations that they could participate in. The other piece in all this is, is that one of the things that I didn't mention that I should have mentioned is that just imagine now if we have all these different alternative ways to have an education, even in a traditional kind of structure, but it will be changed, is how does this impact the alumni experience? You know, and Amanda and I were talking about that at the very beginning, is that when I look at my time at Hope, is that the experience of students who graduated before 1995 was is significantly different than those from 95 on those from 95 on really resonate more to their own um tailored group that they've created through the phone systems right they no longer have to come to hope to experience hope you know when i look at the number of absolutely wonderful people that i've met that graduated in the 80s and the 70s and the 60s they talk about hope with such fondness of being together on this campus. That no longer is the case. You know, my, my kids graduated in 12, 14, 16, and their, their community of friends is on a phone. And the faculty they know is on a phone. So they do not have to just come back here just to be here to have that hope thing anymore, right? So that so so to answer your question, no. I mean, one, they should not be shamed. Shame is the biggest thing we have that I really struggle with. That's not a, that's not fair. You know, they're doing what they need to do, and that's what they ought to be. They ought to be lifted up for that. I'm wondering if you would comment on what we've come to learn is dark money, where people have a, an agenda, they have money, and they will buy that agenda through the schools. 
probably without making it too obvious, but it's happening. And I'm wondering, even in a school like Michigan State, is that happening there? It's not as likely no. to be happening here, no. maybe, no. but is state being able, you were talking about the coaches and the athletic no. program. What about the academic programs? No. Well, it's always an interesting question, right? Is, is, that, is that we know that there are gifts that are given or wanting to be given for certain reasons, right? And I think that's, that's a dilemma, right? And so it really is, is it's, Absolutely. But it's incumbent upon the president or those people involved to say, this is not who we are. Right. And so when you look at that, I, I'm, I'm not in those rooms. I'm not in those tables. But I certainly think that for many schools, it's been fascinating to see how students have risen up against certain individuals who have a checkered history. Right. Who have been involved in different kinds of things, which have not been very ethical. And they're saying, you need to give that money back. You need to remove their name from buildings and we don't want that money. And so there are institutions that have had to give money back for some of that dark money. So there are some things, but again, it's really students who are driving some of those kind of conversations or those presidents who ethically will say, no, we're not going to do X to get Y. Thank you. So this has been delightful. We have a question and a comment online. Gary says, colleges and universities have helped to increase the productivity of almost every industry except higher ed. How can Hope's productivity be increased? Whoa, whoa. Um, well, I think you have to look at what does productivity look like for higher education. So for example, when you look at the class size is that we kind of have standards that are driven by accreditation that says you will have these numbers of students in these kind of classes. So it's not like we can just say we're going to have 50 persons per class um, and get away, get away with that. So, so, so productivity is one. I think technology is one of those ways that, that you can use some innovative ways to do that. And I think when we had COVID, we really had to flip very quickly to do some of that kind of adjusting where we had to do some online teaching. Um, so, so I think that would be one way I think you could increase access for, for that. Um, the, the other piece is that um, you have some faculty members who really love to teach. I mean, that's what they really love. That's what they're really good at, is that they ought to be able to be able to teach as much as they want to teach. There's other faculty members who like to teach a little, but also like to do a lot of research. They ought to be rewarded for that. But what we try to do is we, we try to do the same things we do as students, is they have to do both and, right? And so for me, one of the questions would be is, is that if you're really a great teacher, let them be a great teacher. If it's Dr. Dershman, let him teach for, for as many classes as he, he feels he can do. But if he really likes to do research, then let him be a great researcher and maybe have one class to teach, right? So it's, it's the ability to kind of let people, rather than asking people to do both ends, because I think for any of us, there are certain things that are easier for me to do than others, you know? But I spend, a, so for me, writing is one of those things that I spend a lot of time on. So writing is that labor. And I will spend a whole afternoon writing a good two pages of work, right? My son, on the other hand, can write like nobody's business. He'll do that in half an hour. So why should I spend a whole afternoon writing something when it can take Peter, you know, half an hour? But what I can do is I can spend my whole afternoon with students and do that. But for Peter, that'll take him two days. So part of it is to begin looking at our gifts and li living into our gifts a little bit different that increase the productivity. The other side is, again, when you look at it, why don't we go year-round and really encourage us to be a year-round institution? We are built around an agrarian society still, right? And so what do we have the summers off for? Because that's when all the kids have to go back to the farm and work on the farm, you know? There is no reason why we cannot construct some things that we could not be more effective 
by doing that. If you look at Dartmouth, Dartmouth expects every student to go away for one full semester, and thereby they can they can get a certain number of students back into the system because they have a they have a certain number of students gone. Kalamazoo College is the same thing. So there's ways in which you can structure a curriculum that would be helpful too. We have one last online question from Bill. He said, my feelings about President Scogin's hope forward concept directly and positively affect my concerns noted above about uh, safe places and controversial topics. A great middle way to have robust conversations between different viewpoints. Thank you. I don't think I heard a question. I have a comment. Thank you, Richard. It's a fascinating presentation. Enjoyed it. Thank you.